The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss molecular testing, how it is used to guide treatment decisions. My name is Alex Sierra. I'm the Research Grants Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Patrick Wen, MD. Dr. Wen is Professor of Neuro-Oncology at Harvard Medical School, the Director of the Center for Neuro-Oncology at Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center, Co-Director of the Adult Brain Tumor Consortium, and Editor-in-Chief of Neuro-Oncology. His work is focused on developing novel therapies for brain tumors with a focus on targeted molecular therapy. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Wen. You may now begin your presentation. Thanks so much, Alex. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to uh, be here to do this webinar. Hopefully, it'll be useful to the uh, people listening. So what I'm going to try and do is give you a brief overview of uh, genes and targeted molecular therapy, or as some people call it, precision medicine. This will hopefully build on the other webinar that Dr. Keith Ligon from Dana-Farber gave uh, recently, where he talked more about the techniques that are used to uh, determine the molecular changes in brain tumors. And then I'll talk a little bit about the specific molecular tests that can be useful for different types of brain tumors, specifically glioblastoma, anaplastic gliomas, uh, low-grade gliomas, and then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of the less common tumors for which there has also been a lot of progress in determining the molecular changes and helping to guide treatment. If you have questions, please uh, send them in to us, and I'd be happy to try and answer them at the end of the presentation. So the first step in all of this is surgery, and in addition to getting enough tissue for histologic diagnosis. This is a really critical step to get enough tissue for all the molecular testing that uh, I'm going to talk about. Hopefully in the future we can get an idea of the molecular makeup of brain tumors through imaging or through blood tests. But right now we can't do that. So the, the thing we have to do is get enough tissue. And so getting enough tissue from surgery is really critical. And it can be a problem, especially if only a biopsy is obtained. But nowadays, the surgeons are very good, and they can, even on a biopsy, get enough tissue uh, if they know that this is critical. So it's very important for patients and families, before you go into surgery, to talk to the surgeon to try and make sure that enough tissue is obtained not just to make the histologic diagnosis by looking at the slides, but also to have enough tissue for all the molecular testing that I'll talk about in a little bit, as well as having enough tissue so that if you decide to join a clinical trial, you'll have tissue to allow you to join that clinical trial. Many trials will require anything from 10 slides to 30 or 40 slides. And so the more tissue you have, uh, the better. Most of the testing that uh, I'll mention can be done in formalin fixed paraffin slides, but uh, some centers have the capacity to get frozen tissue as well, and if that's possible, uh, that's often a good thing. And then some centers even will have the ability to take fresh tissue for specific trials to make vaccines, or sometimes to put into mouse models of brain tumors to help uh, in, in screening uh, the effectiveness of drugs. Those are less important. But the most important thing really is to make sure that your surgeon takes enough tissue and stores it so that you can do all the molecular testing you want and also to enter whatever trials you want down the road. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of uh, targeted molecular therapies. Dr. Ligon probably uh, discussed this a little bit in his seminar, but I, and many of you may, may be familiar with this, but for those of you who are not, I just want to mention 
and, and give you some background on genes. So what, what is a gene? Genes are part of the DNA uh, in, in our cells. It's in the nucleus. And so every cellular process, including the growth of the cell, is based on this genetic information and the production of a proper protein that helps uh, allow the cell to grow. And if these genes become damaged or mutated, they make the wrong protein. And as a result, you can get various types of diseases. And if the gene that um, is damaged is one that controls the growth of a cell, then you end up with a tumor or cancer. And so why is this important? If we can identify the damaged gene, we can develop drugs that block the effect of that damaged gene and hopefully uh, restore health or in the case of tumors, stop the tumor from growing or even kill the tumor. So in the cell, on the surface of the cell are many receptors. And these are important for normal cell function. But in a cancer cell, in, in, in tumors like glioblastomas, there are often multiple copies of these receptors sending extra signals to the nucleus of the cell. They send these signals through uh, signaling pathways. And often in these tumors, there are also abnormalities of these signaling pathways. So sometimes the receptors may be normal, but there are mutations in these pathways that allow the extra signals to be sent to the nucleus of the cell, to the DNA, causing the cell to divide and grow and to cause trouble. There's been a lot of progress in understanding the major molecular changes in brain tumors. Um, a number of years ago, the National Cancer Institute sponsored a project called the Cancer Genome Atlas. And the first cancer that was sequenced was actually glioblastoma. And so we have a good idea of the major molecular changes in these tumors. The receptors on the cell surface that are turned on and the various signaling pathways that are listed here. When drugs were first developed against various molecular targets, over 15 years ago, there was so much hope that this would be the way we would cure cancer. And some of the earlier drugs were really effective. The first one was something called Gleevec, which was directed against a particular molecular change in patients with a leukemia called chronic myelogenous leukemia. And these patients had traumatic responses, and some of them were even cured. But these drugs are like bullets. And as with any bullet, you have to aim it at the right target. And if you don't aim it at the right target, then you don't get the benefits and you can get bad side effects. And so in any cancer and in, in brain tumors, there are different molecular changes. And so some of these molecular changes will predict that that tumor will respond to a specific drug or a combination of drugs. There may be some molecular changes that predict that that uh, tumor will not respond to a drug, or that that tumor will, have, will be more likely to have side effects if you give the patient that particular drug. And so these molecular changes are very important in predicting which drugs or which combinations we use. Nowadays, many centers can take the tumor and so at surgery, you can remove the tumor. The pathologist can look at it and make a histologic diagnosis under the microscope. But then in addition to that, you can take the tumor, whether it's fresh uh, tissue or frozen tissue or more often uh, fixed tissue in paraffin, and you can analyze it and understand the molecular changes in this tumor. So for instance, at Dana-Farber, we use two tests right now that look at the molecular changes. One is called Oncopanel, which looks at 275 genes. We, we sequence the tumor to look at these genes. These genes are the most commonly abnormal genes in, in tumors. And with the hope that if we find mutations, there are potential targets for therapy. And this is right now offered free for our patients. And then in addition, we can look at uh, 
chromosome copy number, which I'll talk about in a little bit. In addition, if there is extra tissue and if there's expertise at your hospital, sometimes you can take the tumor and uh, grow the tumor in, in the laboratory and put it in mice and treat the mice with various drugs to see if that would predict benefit in patients. This approach is being developed right now. It's not easy to get an answer quickly, but eventually, hopefully, this will be a way to screen drugs and help decide which patients will benefit from specific drugs. So the goal of all this, in terms of understanding the molecular changes in these tumors, is that you would identify the mutation in each person's tumor, or the group of mutations in each person's tumor, and use the right drug for that patient. So for instance, the first patient with the mutation A would get this drug A, whereas the person here with the mutation C would not benefit from drug A, but would benefit from drug C. And so we're trying to match the drug to the patient's molecular changes and produce better results. So this is what's called precision medicine, and it's one uh, strategy that is being developed for all cancers, including many types of brain tumors. This is an example of a patient with melanoma, which is a very aggressive skin cancer. <clears throat> this is a PET scan showing that this patient, unfortunately, had metastases in his liver and various parts of the body. And within 15 days of getting a BRAF inhibitor, many of these melanomas have BRAF mutations. You can see the traumatic shrinkage of tumor that can happen with these targeted drugs. So I'm going to now switch and talk a little bit about glioblastoma and the um, molecular chain, uh, tests that would be useful in a patient with glioblastoma. This tumor, as you know, is the most common malignant primary brain tumor. And it's the focus of, of a tremendous amount of research. So the two tests that are useful are routinely for these patients is something called isocitrate dehydrogenase, or IDH, and O6-methylguanine methyltransferase, or we call this MGMT for short. I think these two tests are routinely performed in most uh, centers for patients with glioblastoma. And then in addition, as I mentioned earlier, if, the, if, there's, uh, if there are resources you can sequence the tumor to look for mutations. You can also look at DNA chromosome copy number. And both of these potentially will predict which molecular changes may be driving the tumor growth and allow you to think about specific therapy. And I'll talk about this in a bit. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about isocitrate dehydrogenase. This is a, an enzyme that's important for normal cell function. It's very easy to look for. You can stain a slide with a special antibody, with an antibody against IDH1. And by doing that, you can pick up 90% of these mutations. So it's something that's very easy for a pathologist to do. However, if you want to catch 100% of the mutations, so if you want to look for the remaining 10%, then you have to sequence the tumor. And that's available at many centers, but that's not uh, available at all centers. But between the staining and the sequencing, you can catch almost 100% of these mutations. And why is IDH important? Well, one thing in glioblastomas is that it's a predictor of the aggressiveness of the tumor and how well people do. So patients who have an IDH mutation tend to do, in general, better than those who don't have the mutation. So it's what's called a prognostic marker. It predicts, to some extent, how well the patient will do. And it gives the doctor an idea of the aggressiveness of the tumor. There are also uh, trials that are being developed with drugs that block IDH. And you know, if those pan out, then potentially 
it's also a therapeutic target for molecular drugs. The other molecular change that is frequently looked at in patients with glioblastoma is MGMT. MGMT is a repair enzyme. So it's present in about 65% of glioblastomas. And when it's present, when you treat a patient with temozolomide or temodar, the standard chemotherapy, temodar produces some molecular changes in the DNA, and this eventually leads to the death of the tumor cell. But if the tumor cell has MGMT, it repairs the changes that temodar is trying to make, and it makes the tumor cell resistant. To temodar. If the promoter of the MGMT gene is methylated, the gene is turned off. So in this 35% of patients, the tumor cells don't make MGMT. If you give temodar or temozolomide to the patient's tumor, the temozolomide is now able to cause damage to the tumor cell and kill the tumor. And so they, these patients whose tumors don't have MGMT, who have what's called a methylated MGMT promoter. They're more sensitive to temodar and should do better. So to summarize this, if the patient has an M a methylated MGMT promoter, it means the tumor cells make less MGMT and they should be more sensitive to temozolomide. If they have an unmethylated MGMT promoter, the tumor cells have a lot of MGMT. This makes them resistant to temozolomide, and temozolomide is less helpful. So a methylated MGMT is a good thing. Uh, they respond better, the tumors respond better to temozolomide. Unmethylated MGMT is not as good. They respond less well to temozolomide. And people have done the studies to look at how people do with a methylated MGMT promoter. These are the tumor cells that don't have a lot of MGMT. And these patients generally do better than those who have an unmethylated MGMT promoter, where the tumor cells have more MGMT that tend to be more resistant to the temozolomide. So MGMT is important both as a predictor of how well people might do, so it's what's called a prognostic factor, but it also predicts for sensitivity to temozolomide. And so those patients with a methylated MGMD promoter do better than those with an unmethylated promoter, and they do better uh, when treated with temozolomide. So it's both a prognostic factor, telling us how well the patient might do, but it also predicts whether the temozolomide will be useful. This study that uh, is shown here was the original study that left, led to temozolomide approval for glioblastomas, and it is, it's in generally patients younger than 65. But this um, issue with MGMT, its importance is perhaps even more clear in patients who are above the age of 70. There are now a couple of studies a couple of large studies that suggest that if the patient has a methylated MGMT promoter, so the tumor cells don't make MGMT and they're more sensitive to temozolomide, <coughs> they respond much better than those with an unmethylated MGMT promoter. And so nowadays, uh, many neuro-oncologists will suggest that in patients who are above the age of 70, if they have an unmethylated MGMT promoter, so the tumor cells have this repair enzyme and they're more resistant to temozolomide, it might be unhelpful to give temozolomide. And many people are now dropping temozolomide from the regimen in, these, in this group of patients. So I mentioned the other more sophisticated testing, looking for mutations by sequencing the tumor and looking at chromosome copy number. This technology has advanced tremendously in the past few years. 
when the first DNA was sequenced in, in a person, it cost billions of dollars. But now the cost of sequencing has really come down significantly. And you can do um, sequencing of most of the important genes for a few thousand dollars. And for selected panels, the cost is now less than a thousand dollars in some cases. So it becomes possible to do this on, on every patient, potentially. Um, so it's, it's becoming a, a valuable tool to, to help decide on the best treatment for patients. So when you sequence DNA, the DNA, as you remember, is in the nucleus of the cell. And uh, this is where the, the chromosome is. You can take the DNA from these cells and through uh, fairly sophisticated algorithms and technology, you can determine the sequence of the uh, nucleotides in the DNA. And this will allow you to determine whether there are mutations or whether parts of the gene are missing. The other test that can be done is to look at chromosome copy number. So in all our cells, we have two copies of every chromosome. And uh, here, this is a man, so the only exception is that they have an X and a Y chromosome. A woman would have two X chromosomes. But this is what a normal a cell with a normal chromosome number looks like, two copies of everything. On the right side is a cancer cell showing that some chromosomes have extra copies. Some of them are missing parts of the chromosome. And there are tests uh, such as array CGH that can look at these chromosome copy numbers and help us decide which chromosomes are amplified, there are extra copies of it, and which ones are lost. And this also helps us decide which molecular pathways may be turned on and which molecular pathways may be turned off. And so between looking at chromosome copy number and the mutations, we can get a good idea of the major molecular changes that are driving the growth of the brain tumor cells. So as I mentioned, the Cancer Genome Atlas has characterized many of the major molecular changes in glioblastoma. One of the most important changes are extra copies of receptors that are turned on on the cell surface. And among these receptors, the one that's turned on most is the epiderm of growth factor receptor. You get extra copies of this receptor in about 50% of glioblastoma patients. So this is a very common molecular change. And instead of getting two copies of the chromosome in a cell, you can see in these cells they have multiple copies. And this is what's called amplification. And uh, this is a test that's fairly simple to do. And so it's, uh, it's available at, at many centers around the country. In addition to having amplification in some of these uh, tumors that have the epidermal growth factor receptor amplification, there are also specific mutations that drive the cell growth. And both these amplifications and mutations are potential targets for therapy. And so, for instance, these are some of the trials that uh, have been done in the past year at our center. There are molecular drugs that uh, can be used to block the EGFR receptor. There are antibody drug conjugates that target these receptors. And then there are vaccines that target some of these mutations. So there are potentially quite a lot of uh, clinical trials that are directed against the epidermal growth factor receptor, or EGFR. Similarly, there are other receptors that are turned on. These are less frequent. So for instance, the MET receptor is amplified not very commonly, only in 2% of patients. But there are drugs and trials that are ongoing that are targeting this group of patients. And in, at least in preliminary uh, studies, some of these patients who have extra copies of, the re of these receptors seem to be sensitive to these drugs. Another receptor that um, has molecular changes is the fibroblast growth factor receptor. And there are particular fusions that are present, again, in a small percentage of patients. 
and there are clinical trials with drugs that are trying to block these receptors. These are much less common, and so you have to screen a lot of patients to find the ones that have the right molecular changes for these drugs. In addition to blocking receptors, there are a number of important signaling pathways that are turned on. So in glioblastomas, one of the most important signaling pathways is something called the PI3 kinase pathway. This is turned on in over 70% of glioblastoma patients. <coughs> and there are a number of drugs, some of them shown here, that block various components of these pathways that are in clinical trials. There are two other important signaling pathways in glioblastoma. One is the PDK46 pathway. This is present, uh, this is important in cell division, and it's present in about 80% of glioblastoma patients. And there are drugs that are being approved for breast cancer that are also being studied in glioblastoma. And so this uh, gives you an idea of how, by testing the tumor for various uh, molecular changes, whether it's receptors that are turned on, amplified, or mutated, or <clears throat> various signaling pathways that are turned on, you can potentially find clinical trials with drugs that are directed at those molecular changes. Before I finish with glibosoma, I just also want to mention immunotherapy. This is a very um, hot area in all of cancer. In patients with skin cancer, melanoma, there really have been dramatic results with uh, uh, drugs that stimulate the immune system. It's called checkpoint inhibitors with drugs like ipilimumab, uh, prembolizumab, or nivolumab. These are all FDA approved for melanoma and they stimulate the immune system. One of the things that helps predict whether these drugs work is the presence of molecules on the surface of the cell called PDL1. And you can see on this slide that PDL1 is also present in a subset of glioblastomas. And so there are trials now uh, using these uh, checkpoint inhibitors in glioblastoma where the patient's tumor is sent to be screened for PDL1. And if the PDL1 is turned on, then they are potentially eligible for these trials. This is not um, a commercially available test now, so it's somewhat restricted in its uh, availability. Uh, in tumor cells that don't have PDL1, it doesn't mean these drugs don't work, but they, they work with a lower rate of success. And I think as we go forward, you'll, you'll hear more about uh, molecular screening for, for immunotherapy studies as well as for targeted molecular therapy studies. I'm going to move on now and talk about another important tumor called anaplastic oligodendroglioma. This is less common than glioblastoma, and they tend to occur in patients who are in their 40s primarily. These are tumors that sometimes enhance, but often are not enhancing. The characteristic of these tumors is the loss of chromosome 1P19Q. And so here you see a normal cell with two uh, copies of uh, each of these. And here you see a cell that's lost 1P, one, one so it has only one copy of it. So these tests. Uh, of fish or fluorescent in situ hybridization is a test that can be performed at many centers. And there are many ways to look for this. But this shows a loss of 1P in this uh, tumor. And then here um, you see loss of uh, 1P again here. And, and you see loss of 19Q here. So this loss of 1P, 19Q is very important for these tumors. And now, actually, by definition, almost, if they find this molecular change, regardless of what the pathologist thinks the tumor is, it's an oligodendroglioma. Loss of 1P19Q makes it an oligodendroglioma. And if you have a grade 2 or 3 tumor and you have the 1P19Q intact, 
probably an astrocytoma. This is a way to differentiate between the two types of uh, two subsets of, of lower grade gliomas. The importance of anaplastic oligodendrogliomas with its 1P19Q loss is that they can be very sensitive to chemotherapy. So this is an old study done by doctors Kane Cross and McDonald showing that with a PCV chemotherapy regimen, these tumors can melt away and they're very sensitive to this type of chemotherapy. Subsequently, two large studies were performed looking at the value of radiation and chemotherapy in these anaplastic oligodendrogliomas. One was done in the United States by the Radiation Therapy Oncology Group where they compared patients who had radiation alone to this PCV chemotherapy. This is a three-drug regimen followed by radiation therapy. And at the same time, a similar study was done in Europe by the EORTC group where they gave patients either radiation alone or radiation with six cycles of PCV. So basically, both trials compared radiation alone or radiation with chemotherapy. And what, these both, what both these trials showed is that the addition of radiation with chemotherapy uh, produce a much better outcome than radiation alone. The combination or the addition of radiation uh, of chemotherapy significantly improved uh, patient survival. What they also found was that if you had loss of 1P19Q, you did much better with the treatment than if you didn't have loss of 1P19Q. And that, in, in this other study, uh, that shows the same thing, that loss of 1P19Q resulted in much better outcome with a combination of radiation and PCV compared to radiation alone. If you had intact 1P19Q, you still did a little better than uh, with chemotherapy added but it was a very modest effect and wasn't really statistically significant. And so the net results of both these trials is that patients with 1P19Q loss and grade 3 uh, oligodendrogliomas is that they tend to do better and they're more sensitive to chemotherapy with PCV. And because of this study, now patients with anaplastic gliomas, especially if they have loss of 1P19Q, are routinely treated with both radiation and chemotherapy, either with PCV or with temozolomide from the day of diagnosis. So these studies have changed the way we treat grade 3 gliomas. <coughs> There's also a lot of um, advances in grade 2 gliomas. These are in tumors that grow more slowly. They tend to occur in patients who are in their 30s and 40s and uh, usually present with seizures. So this is a patient with an astrocytoma. It doesn't take up dye, doesn't take up contrast on MRI. And this is what it looks like under the microscope. And it's characterized by certain molecular changes that I'll mention in including IDH, which we discussed earlier. The other type of low-grade glioma is an oligodendroglioma. These are tumors that have the 1P19Q loss, and they have this so-called fried egg appearance. This is the nucleus with this halo around it. And if you see this, then it's an oligodendroglioma. The Cancer Genome Atlas Project over the past few years has done a lot of work in understanding the molecular changes in, in these low-grade tumors. And uh, there will be some papers coming out later this year that have completely changed the classification of these tumors. And the most important predictor in both grade 2 and 3 lower-grade gliomas is whether the tumor has IDH mutation. In about 20%, they don't have an IDH mutation. And these tumors tend to grow more quickly and probably should be treated more aggressively. and Maybe should be treated more like glioblastomas. If they have the IDH mutation, 
you can separate them out based on whether they have the 1P19Q loss. If they have this loss, they're oligodendroglioma's and they grow the slowest. If they don't have this loss, they're probably lower grade astrocytomas and they have an intermediate rate of growth. And so as I mentioned before, you can look for these IDH mutations by staining the slides or by sequencing the tumor. And 80% um, of these tumors will have these mutations. And there are drugs now, uh, such as this one, EG120, that is in progress trying to target these tumors with these IDH mutations. There are also clinical trials of vaccines against these IDH mutations that are ongoing. So this is an area of tremendous excitement. Hopefully, these drugs or these vaccines will still be helpful. And the other thing that uh, you can do with these tumors is that if you have an IDH mutation, the tumors make very large quanti quantities of something called 2-HG. And you can do special MRIs called MR spectroscopy to look for 2-HG in these tumors. And, and this can help you with diagnosis. And potentially, it helps you with a marker of response to treatment. And then finally, in the last few minutes, uh, I want to leave time for questions. I just want to touch on some other types of tumors. Um, there are lower-grade gliomas, such as gangliogliomas, that have a high rate of mutation. This is a mutation that has really helped melanoma, uh, BRAF E600E mutation. This responds very well to drugs in melanoma. It's present in 60% of gangliogliomas, so potentially it's a target. It's present in 60% of another lower-grade tumor called pleomorphic xanthroastrocytoma. And this is a patient we treated with a BRAF inhibitor, showing a, a basically a complete response to this molecular drug. Um, pilocytic astrocytomas are slow-growing tumors, often in the back of the brain, the cerebellum. They have a different kind of molecular change. It's called a BRAF fusion. And all these three types of tumors and others respond potentially to combination of drugs that target the BRAF pathway. And there are trials ongoing right now that combine drugs like dibrafenib and trametinib, targeting brain tumors that have these BRAF mutations. Another area where there has been tremendous progress is medulloblastoma. These are, these are some of the most common tumors in children, but also in young adults. And scientists have really now divided these tumors into four groups. There's a WINS group that does really well with standard therapies. And the goal in these patients is to try and reduce the radiation dose so they have less side effects. There's another group that has the sonic hedgehog pathway turned on. There are drugs now that target the sonic hedgehog pathway. And this is a patient uh, showing up a, a PET scan again before with multiple metastases that responded to inhibitor of sonic hedgehog, showing the dramatic responses that can occur. So, so the area of medulloblastoma is really one of tremendous promise. And even meningiomas, this is the most common primary brain tumor. Usually you can just take the tumor out. But there are some tumors that are much slower growing and recur after radiation and surgery for which there's no good treatment. Uh, people have now found mutations in a subset of these tumors. Uh, in about 15% of these tumors, they have smoothen or AKT mutations for which there are potentially drugs that can be used. And then the other area where there's a lot of interest is in brain metastases. These are tumors that go to the brain from other parts of the body. And this is a patient with lung cancer that has an EGFR mutation showing a response to an EGFR inhibitor. Uh, the molecular changes in other cancers are potentially better worked out than in brain tumors. And so this is another area of tremendous uh, interest and, and potential. So this is a very quick run through of um, the molecular changes in brain tumors and how they can be used in patients. There really has been a lot of progress in understanding the genetics of brain tumors. This molecular information provides information on outcome and prognosis. 
on potential responses to treatments and potential molecular targets to, uh, for drugs. And it's really important for the physician to work with the patients to make full use of the available resources and to try and maximize the treatment options that are available. So thank you so much for listening and that I'll try and answer some questions. Dr. Wen, thank you for that presentation. That was very informative. And we've got some great questions that have come in. And um, without further delay, I will ask the first one. And the first question we've got is, are all of the testing facilities equal? Do they adhere to industry standards? So, so this is an area that is very much in development. And right now, there are no common standards. Um, some centers will have a small panel, others will have a larger panel. And so unfortunately, there, um, there is a lot of variability in the quality and reliability of these tests. And so it's important to work with your doctor to find um, good places to send your tumor to to be tested. Thank you. Um, question number two is, can personalized medicine play a role in protecting or defending against a recurrence? I think that's ultimately the goal of, of doing this. Um, so one example of this, although it's not a drug, is a, a vaccine uh, called rindopepumut that's been developed by Celdex against the mutation that's in about 20% of glioblastoma patients called EGFRV3. Patients get radiation and temidar, and then they also get this vaccine. And the hope is that the vaccine will help kill off the tumor cells to prevent recurrence. That trial is completed, and we'll probably know the results in the next year or so. And so that's an example, potentially, of using personalized uh, medicine to prevent a recurrence. Great, that's promising. We'll look forward to those results. Um, question number three is, is there a point where a biomarker would go undetected only to be found later? It, it's, it's definitely possible. It depends on how reliable the initial tests were. So some tests will miss biomarkers. Even MGMT, which is a test that's been around for 10 years or more. It's not perfect, so that's one issue. Another issue is that the molecular changes in the patient's tumor at diagnosis may not be exactly the same changes when the tumor comes back. And so sometimes different molecular changes appear, and so it's not that the test missed it, but, but because they're just new mutations or other molecular changes. And so the testing that's done must be done on the current tumor sample, correct? Right now, most of the testing is done usually on the initial tumor t uh, sample. But the, qu the questioner you know, makes a very good point. And there is some thought in the field that perhaps if it's feasible when the, p when the tumor recurs that we should really be taking the recurrent tumor doing a biopsy or surgery and testing the recurrent sample so that we have the most current specimen to test. So the field is not quite there yet, but I think it's moving in that direction. It's hard to make someone go through a second surgery primarily for molecular testing, but we might have to think about doing that. Great. Is there a perfect sample amount to be taken? I think you have to take, I think, as much as possible. Um, it really takes quite a lot of tissue, for instance, to do the MGMT testing. And so I think it's important to work with your surgeon. You know, the maximum amount that's safe to take out, um, they, they should try and do that. And they should keep it. Uh, a lot of times, they, they will suck out the tumor, and they don't keep that tumor. So as much as possible is, is important. And this is primarily an issue when, when patients get a biopsy. Uh, 
in the old days, you can just take a little bit and then show it to the pathologist, and they'll say it's a glioblastoma, and that's the end of the testing. But now you really need enough tissue for all these other molecular tests to, to really come up with a good treatment plan. So this is conversation that happens prior to surgery with the surgeon or general oncologist or all of the team working together? I think all of the team, but especially with the surgeon. At, at brain tumor centers, they're usually familiar with the need to take a lot of tissue whenever possible. But in the community, they, uh, the surgeons may be a little less familiar with uh, how much tissue they really need to take. And so if possible, before the surgery, you can have this conversation with them. And they, they will then hopefully take enough tissue so that you can make use of all the advances that are now available. Great. Do you recommend that patients get this testing done if they are at a current if they are currently treated at a center that does not do genetic testing? I think if um, if if it's possible, I think it it can be useful. I don't want to pretend that it's useful in everybody. So you can do the testing, and either there aren't a lot of mutations, or there are mutations that are not druggable. But in a subset of people, if you do this testing, you'll find mutations for which there are drugs out there or clinical trials out there. And it gives you a, a, an added set of options. The other thing is that if you do these, this testing and you don't have a specific molecular target, so for instance, if you're thinking of doing a trial that targets EGFR, some, some of those trials will let you in without knowing whether you have the target. But if you know you don't have the target, then there's no point doing that trial because it, it was never going to work. And so then you would be spared going into a trial that had no chance of helping you. So I think if possible, it's worth doing it. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Wen. That's all the time that we have for today. But um, I want to thank you all for joining us, and thanks once again to Dr. Wen. For more information on the topics discussed here today, or for more information on brain tumors and their treatment options, our licensed healthcare professionals can provide you with support or help you navigate information available on the ABTA website. You may also call the ABTA Care Line at 1-800-886-2282. We're going to pause for a moment to conclude our webinar recording.